Oh, what's cracking, YouTube? Welcome back to the channel. It's your boy Nick. Big dogs got to eat fantasy football, and you know I'm going to stay repping the Falcons gear throughout all the NFC South videos. Today, we got the Tampa Bay Buccaneers team outlook. Fantasy Football 2017. If you've been watching my other outlooks and you've enjoyed or any of the videos I put up, just scroll down right now and just hit that thumbs up. I would love the shit out of you if you did that. You don't have to do it now, but if you enjoy this video, please make sure you do it afterwards. Should be an exciting video today because the Bucks went out and made a lot of moves this offseason. They done did it. The GM did their homework. So let's get right into it. All right, so let's talk about the Bucks as a whole, right? Looking back at 2014, they were bad. They ranked 28th in scoring, 17.3 points per game. Fast forward a year after they drafted Jameis Winston, that number jumped up to 21.4 points per game. Another year later, jumps up again, 22.1 points per game. Brings us to 2017. After all the moves that they've made this offseason, they've quickly become one of the more intriguing offenses in the NFL. And I would be surprised if they jumped into the top 10 in scoring now. Great correlation line by their front office. Good work, good stuff, Tampa Bay, but still fuck you for not being the Falcons. So let's talk about famous Jameis. Crab stealing mother son. He's the first quarterback in NFL history to start his career off with two back-to-back 4,000-yard -back passing seasons. I'm going to follow up by saying he threw the second most interceptions in the NFL last year, 18, right behind Phillip Rivers. Call me crazy. Call me nuts. But I think that second statistic, the 18 interceptions, is a good thing for his fantasy outlook in 2017. Listen, this, this is why. That means he's a slinger. He's not afraid to take shots. He's not afraid to chuck the ball all over the field, right? He lets his guys go up, make plays. When you look at his weapons last year, the team was not built for that. Looking at 2017, they are. They added Deshaun Jackson on the outside, rookie Chris Godwin, rookie OJ Howard. All really, really good in their own sense of things. So you have Deshaun Jackson, an absolutely elite deep threat. Obviously, everyone knows that. He's, he's been doing it for the last six, seven, eight years. I don't even know how old the guy. I think he's like 30 now. Elite deep, deep threat. Works perfectly with Winston's willingness to chuck the ball. Then you have Chris Godwin. Probably don't really know that much about Chris Godwin. I'll get into a little bit more later, but he had an 85.7% conversion rate on contested catches coming out of college as per Matt Harmon, who does the reception perception and looks at individual players and like scouts them and watches every game and every route they run. So he was incredible against contested catches. Perfect for someone with those interceptions. You're throwing into a lot of coverage. Chris Godwin comes away with those balls rather than letting the defenders steal them from him. Thirdly, OJ Howard, just an elite tight end in every sense of the word. Can't wait to see how that situation plays out there, to be honest with you. So huge upgrades for the weapons. I think the interception total plays into his favor this year, and you see that number dip pretty dramatically. I know everyone's going to be thinking the same thing. Like, oh, Winston's a huge sleeper. Winston's going to have a huge breakout year this year. That's the problem. Fantasy community already thinks so. He's getting drafted as quarterback six right now. That means ahead of Matt Ryan, He's right behind Russell Wilson, ahead of Marcus Mariota, Derek Carr, all those guys that are in that like six, seven, eight, nine, ten range. Winston is the first one going off the board. I cannot co-sign that. You could wait two, three, four rounds and get Kirk Cousins, Ben Roethlisberger, Matt Stafford. That's a thing. I like. I'll always preach the late round quarterback thing to you. If you ain't first, you're last when it comes to that. So I like what's a good year. I just don't think he has a lot of value as a fantasy pick where he's going. So let's talk about Mike Evans, another guy who I think is gonna have a great year. I don't think he's a value at where he's going. He's a fourth wide receiver off the board, seventh overall right now with ADP. Now Evans led the league in air yards per game, targets per game, end zone targets per game, target market share for his team, touchdown market share, first down market share. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera, and then some. All as per Pro Football Focus. So it's going to be his fourth year, right? Last year he had the second highest average depth of target among all wide receivers in the NFL with more than 75 targets. That's great, right? Because he gets a huge share of the deep balls. Good for fantasy projections. You know, it's always going to be there for him. Except. The one guy who finished ahead of him is now on his team, Deshaun Jackson, and he's going to take away a lot of those air yards, a lot of those deep balls from Mike Evans. I still think he's a no-brainer wide receiver one. I love that. But I think all the additions to the team, it, it, you know, he's not going to have those 170 targets that he had last year to work with again. I want to read a stat that just came out the other day from Roto World also, which is like pretty mind-blowing. So Evans was a top 12 fantasy scorer in just one one of the final eight weeks of the season. And he finished outside the top 40 in four of those eight games. Like, that's not a guy I want to pick at number seven overall. I will glad, I'll take AJ Green and I'll take 
Jordy Nelson over Mike Evans at that spot. You know, the touchdown total upside is definitely there, but I think target totals go down. I think he doesn't get as many deep balls. Uh, as you can see, he was not consistent over the second half of the year. So I think Mike Evans is going way too high this year in drafts. So as I just touched on, obviously D. Jacks moves over from Washington, signs three years, 35 million. He's going to play opposite Mike Evans on the other side. You pretty much know exactly what you're getting from D. Jacks. He's been consistent over his year in terms of fantasy production. So there's some stats I found between Philadelphia and Washington, the two last teams he's played on. In seasons where he's played at least 14 games, he's finished between 910 yards and 1170 receiving yards in six out of the seven. He averaged 6.6 .6 touchdowns in those years. You know you're getting around 1,000 yards. You know you're getting between like five and seven touchdowns from D-Jax. We'll open up the field. Definitely a big upgrade for a Jameis Winston at quarterback for sure. And as always, Jackson's a better best ball player. He'll give you those, those big games, but he's going to be very up and down as always. Uh, he's probably a mid wide receiver three, probably in my wide receiver 35-ish, give or take a few spots in that kind of ranking zone. So definitely not a guy if I took, if I've taken wide receivers that are a little bit riskier in the beginning of the draft, more boomer bust type guys, then I'm probably gonna stay away from Jackson. But if I have two really solid plays there, maybe I'll think about him. And then uh, we'll touch on Chris Godwin, who I mentioned earlier, 6'1", 210 out of Penn State, really good size, great against contested catches, can go up, leap, get the ball, take the ball out of the air. Dirk Cutter, the way he runs his offense and the way I expect it to be ran a lot this season, especially with adding OJ Howard, they run a lot of two tight end sets, which means it'll be Mike Evans, Deshaun Jackson, OJ Howard, and Cameron Brate, and then whoever's at running back. So I don't think we're going to see a lot of Chris God uh, Godwin, at least not enough for him to make a fantasy impact this year. I do like Godwin a lot in, in dynasty leagues. You never really know when a guy like Deshaun Jackson is going to fall off. His production dips this year like tremendously, and he's just not the same player he was. But Chris Godwin in dynasty leagues a couple years down the road, very athletic, very good skill set. So keep an eye on him. And now we'll get to the tight ends, all right? So we have O.J. Howard getting picked 19th overall. The Bucks, I think he was supposedly rumored the third or fourth overall prospect on their draft board. So for him to fall to 19, was he, they love him. What makes the situation so crazy is that Cameron Brait really came on last year, scored a ton of touchdowns, was so useful in the red zone and near the end zone that they're not going to just go away from him. Brait's obviously going to drop very heavily in the drafts, and O.J. Howard will probably get drafted ahead of him. If you're unfamiliar with Howard, he's a ridiculous blend of athleticism, Great receiving ability, runs a 4-5-40, 6-6, 250, so a ton of size. Incredible blocker, was rated one of the top blockers in the class. Uh, just really good, really good all-around, three-down player. So as I mentioned before, though, tight end position there can be valuable for both guys, Cameron Bray and O.J. Howard. The, the Bucks ran the second most plays from the tight end, uh, the two tight end offense in the NFL last year, over 415 times. They're going to see plenty of opportunity, both of them, and I think they're, they'll be in that set all the time near the end zone. If you think about it, when you're in a two tight end set, you can run the ball because you have extra blockers on both sides, or you can pass the ball. So I think they're both going to play a ton near the end zone, and that's where Brait gets all his value, right? So while this, while drafting O.J. Howard definitely hurts Brait, it doesn't kill him. You have O.J. Howard getting picked uh, overall. Let me check this out right quick. Getting picked 130th overall as tight end 14, and you have Cameron Brait 162nd overall tight end 18. So they're actually not that far apart. Rookie tight ends just don't produce statistical wise. Both of them will probably score a considerable amount of touchdowns. I would put the over under on both of them at, I would say OJ Howard's over under would probably be 5.5, Cameron Brait's six. So maybe six and seven or six and six, something like that. Brait was targeted in the red zone 16 times last year. So a huge part of that piece of the field. And I don't think it's going to go away. He's a big, big receiver, really good in that area. So I'm not banking on Brait to be a top 10 fantasy uh, tight end or anything like that. I do think O.J. Howard has tremendous upside going forward, but I think they both limit each other, so I'm probably not going to own either of them outside of a keeper or a dynasty league. Take that for what it's worth. Ugh, now we get to the worst part of this team. We have the backfield, right? So we have Doug Martin. You look at his game stats. I'll put them on the screen right now, right quick. It's just crazy. You have his rookie year, 1,400 yards, and then two terrible years, and then another great year, and then another terrible year. So you're like, what am I getting out of Doug Martin? When he's healthy, when he's in shape, you're getting a, an all-pro running back. It's impossible to choose whether or not he's, he's going to give you that, right? He's already starting this year out with a three-game suspension because he tested positive for Adderall. God, I'd be fucked. But reports this offseason have been great. GM Jason Licht said he's looked as good as I've seen him, both mentally and physically. He's been outstanding. He looks like the Doug Martin of 2015. So the three-game suspension definitely 
hurts his overall value. I actually think it helps you in a fantasy sense, though, because you get to pick him a lot later. And if you do take the risk on him and he, he's in shape like the GM is saying he is, then he's going to be a huge steal where you're getting him. And right now, he is going off the board 75th overall, running back 27. I'd be okay gambling on that. Running back 27, you're already going to have two running backs on your team by the time you pick Martin. You give yourself another top 12 upside play there by the time he comes back. So you might be hurting. You could always... The good thing about a guy like Martin, right? With these, We've seen it a ton over the last few years, and it's, it's suspensions are piling up. We see a lot of guys start off the year with these suspensions, right? We've seen it with Le'Veon Bell. We see Doug Martin. Or we see guys coming back from injury where they have their backup is basically a plug and play RB2 or RB1. So the good thing is you don't have to draft Martin early. You could draft him late and then you can get guys later. So you can get a Terrence West, who's gonna be a starting running back for the first four weeks because Kenneth Dixon is gone. You know, other running backs where, where their guy is injured for the first couple weeks, where you can plug and play a guy like Terrence West who you could pick in the 12th round. And then boom, when Martin comes back from the third week by the time Kenneth Dixon is gone and West is kind of invaluable to you. You could plug Martin in and you didn't really miss out on anything because you're not using high capital on either of those guys. So I would definitely, I'll definitely be taking a risk on Martin this year on a few of my teams because I do believe in his talent as a player. And as long as the reports keep coming out that he's in shape and he looks really good, then, you know, then I'm, then I'll, I'll gamble. So the rest of the running back depth chart is just littered with, you know, question marks, I guess. You have Jacquez Rogers, who, who came on last year and played really well while Martin was out and while Charles Sims was injured. They re-signed him last year, two years, $3.5 million, nothing crazy. I think he could put up some nice numbers for you while Martin is gone. I think he has some low-end RB2 floor for you there, as long as he's the starter. He's a guy that's going undrafted, RB47, pick 187. So you can take him, use RB2, three numbers, until Martin gets back. I like Jacquez. He showed that he's got a lot of life. A lot, a lot of fight left in the boy. And then you got Charles Sims, who tore his pec last year. Ugh, he was celebrating Titty Tuesday a little too hard. Everyone anointed Charles Sims a couple years ago. Oh, he's an automatic RB1 if Doug Martin ever gets hurt. Doug Martin got hurt. Wasn't a fucking RB1. He's a pass catching specialist. That's what he is. That's what the, the role he's going to play on this team again. He has a 3.8 yards per carry average as a rusher. He's not going to get carries. For me, he's nothing more than an RB4 in PPR leagues. So we move over to who I think is actually the most intriguing play in this backfield. A guy named Jeremy McNichols. Weird spelling of a last name. M-C capital N-I-C-H-O-L-S. So it's Nicholas without the A. From Boise State, 162nd pick overall by the Bucks. He's 5'9", 215, so he's a little shorter, but he's got good build for a running back. He's probably going to have some time before his name can kind of come to light and he can get some playing time here. He's missed the mini camp because he's recovering from surgery um, on, his, on a torn labrum, labrum that happened earlier. So, he, so he's got some work to make up, but the coaching staff loves him. Uh, when you watch his game film, he's a three-down back. Head coach Dirk Cutter said... He's a three-down guy. He could do a little bit of everything. He had a really impressive college stat line. So he 571 carries, 3,200 yards, 44 touchdowns. It's 5.6 yards per carry. He also added 103 catches. He caught 88 balls over the last two years of his college career. He only had two drops over 100 targets there. Dirk Cutter was like drooling about his blocking ability too. He was charted as missing just one block over his final 237 attempts at Boise State. The combine performance is awesome. 449, 40-yard dash, top six spark score at the position. And he's free right now. He's running back 83, overall 215. So I actually might be taking him in a few redraft leagues. Definitely going to be looking out for him in keeper leagues. If you're in a dynasty or keeper league, Jeremy McNichols is a huge pick for you guys. I think Sims' contract is going to be up. Jacquiz Rogers is like 56 years old. Actually, I don't even know how old he is, but he seems like he's old. He's, he's like a journeyman. And who knows what's going to happen with Doug Martin. So Jeremy McNichols, great blocking ability. Can catch the ball. Great runner. Great production in college. I think he was a steal for the Bucks, And I think he has possibly one of the highest upsides. I mean, I guess long-term upsides of any rookie running back this year. So keep an eye out for McNichols. And that's going to wrap up my Buccaneers video. Still shout out Falcons. If you enjoyed the video again, please scroll down give it that thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel if you're new and you enjoyed. We'll be coming at you next video with either the Saints or the Panthers. I'm not sure yet, but comment below. What's your strategy? If you're going to take Doug Martin, first of all, are you looking to draft Doug Martin this year? Second, if you are, what's going to be your strategy for the first couple weeks? Are you going to look to replace it with a plug and play guy like a Terrence West or a Jacquez Rogers? 
Or are you just going to let him sit on your bench and play out with the guys that you drafted ahead of him anyways? I know it's going to be different from league to league because, you know, if you only start two running backs, it's probably not that hard. But I have two running backs, two flex spots, so I can do something like that. But I want to hear your opinion. So I'll see you all next time. As always, thank you for uh, spending your time with me today.